and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Good morning. Question for you today. Have you ever had an expectation that ended up looking just slightly different in reality? You know what I'm talking about? You had one idea of how things would go, but maybe they turned out a little different. You know, the internet has really amplified that in our lives. Let's, let's, I'm going to show you, um, ladies, Pinterest, um, maybe, this, maybe this has happened. <laughs> Movies do this to us as well, don't they? Movies set up expectations in our minds of how things should be, but reality sometimes is slightly different, isn't it? Let's look at another one here. You know, you can't get what happens in the wild from the Lion King. It's just, it's just not reality, is it? Um, you know, sometimes we do it to ourselves. We create ideas in our own minds about how things will be, but reality is different. One great example may be uh, motherhood. Um, Moms, can any of you all relate? You know, this perfect, you know, you, the nursery's ready. Everything is just so ready for this perfect thing. And, you know, that lasts all of just, just a few minutes. Um, you know, and sometimes we really actually do believe things are one way in our minds. I mean, we really believe it. We, um, you know, maybe we, you know, we think we look a certain way, but in reality, it's more like this. Believe it or not, that's actual real footage from the men's retreat. Um, you know, that, that's me and, and Paul Harkle Road right there um, going at it. But we do that, don't we, to ourselves? That, that, is, that is something. Life is full of these types of things, right? Politicians make promises that they don't keep. Right, we see blogs all the time about follow these five easy steps to be healthy and wealthy and wise and successful, all of those things. Products, advertisements make claims, don't they? Eat this or do this to be thinner or to be healthier or to look younger, um, you know, or you know, buy this club to hit the golf ball straighter. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You know, they make promises like, you know, it can taste good and be fat free. No, it can't. That, that's, that's not true. You know, we could, we could go on and on, couldn't we, about all of these kinds of things. But so I want to ask, why would we even bring that up? Why even talk about that right now? Well, well here's the reason why. As you just saw the sermon series that we begin today for the next few weeks we're gonna be looking at the work of the Holy Spirit. And can I just say right up front that if we're honest, for a lot of us in this room today, our tendency is to put the words of Jesus about the Holy Spirit into that category of expectations that maybe don't play out in reality or we might say too good to be true. I think if we're honest, we, we might do that. that. That could be our experience for those of us that are believers in Jesus. What, what is it that the Holy Spirit is doing in my life? And when I hear people talk about the Holy Spirit, maybe that's not been your experience. And so sometimes it just leaves questions. Well, this week and the weeks to come, we're gonna, we're gonna look at the work of the Holy Spirit. So I wanna ask you some questions here. I want you to ponder these questions and what your answer might be to, to these three questions. Do you ever feel like God is someone you know about more than someone you know? How would you answer that? When you speak about the work of God, do you talk more about what he has done in the past than what he's doing right now? And this one gets really close to home. How would you answer this? Do you lack vibrant interaction with God? 
Can I say this, that if you answer any of those questions in the affirmative, if you say yes to any of those, can I just invite you, beg you, implore you, whatever language you wanna use, I don't think there's strong enough language to say please lean into the next few weeks because I can say without a doubt that the whole story arc of scripture is about God wanting to not just know you and you know him intellectually, but to dwell with you and for you to experience him in a powerful way in your life, that and in our church. And so I want you to lean in this. I want us to to be on this journey together for the next few weeks. Because over the next few weeks, we are gonna be looking at the Holy Spirit in our lives individually, but also collectively. Then as a body of believers in this local church, and the incredible statements that we're gonna see in scripture, just, I want you to go ahead and remember, they're not too good to be true kind of statements. They are actually possible. And what God intends for us to experience as his people. And so I wanna invite us, this has been my prayer for myself as I've prepared, but this is my prayer for us as a people over the next few weeks. And so I would encourage you, don't just pray this this morning, but would you make this your prayer over the next few weeks as we come to God's word, looking at the work of the Holy Spirit, and that's this. Father, create in me an appetite that can only be filled by a deep, and satisfying relationship with you through the Holy Spirit and based on the finished work of Christ. Father, may that be our prayer. As we go to the pages of your word, God, as we seek to not just know about you, but God, to know you, to experience you, and to have you continue to transform our lives for your glory. So God, would you speak to us today through your word? God, give us an appetite that can only be satisfied by you. God, teach us about your spirit that you have poured out upon us that indwells us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're gonna start this morning with our look at the Holy Spirit by looking at two passages of scripture in the Gospel of John. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and get it out. Turn to John chapter 14, that's where we'll begin. And then we're gonna jump over and look at a a verse in John chapter 16. But here's what I want you to know about these two verses. They are, they frame in a bigger discussion that Jesus had with his disciples about the work of the Holy Spirit. And I need you to know this as well, this conversation that happens between John 14 and John 16 with Jesus and his disciples happens just hours before Jesus goes to the cross. They have left the upper room in John chapter 13 where Jesus has just washed the disciples' feet. In that section, while they are there in the upper room, think about some of the things that have happened, that have just transpired. Jesus would have just told his disciples that one of them would betray him. Before we get to the verse we're gonna read in John chapter 14 and verse 12, right before that, Jesus has told his disciples that he's getting ready to leave them and that where he is going, they cannot go right now. He's also told them that Peter... Their leader, their vocal, passionate leader is going to deny that he even knows Jesus three times. And then he's gonna tell them that believing in him was necessary to know God and to have peace. So you can just think about all the things swirling in their minds, just the range of emotions that they're feeling, the questions that they have. Everything just seems to have shifted. When you read the narrative of the gospel, you, if you put yourself in it, you could, you could almost just believe that if you were there in that moment, you would say, something's changed. Things just took a shift. Things are about to be very different than our experience has been with Jesus over the last three years. 
And then Jesus makes this statement in John chapter 14, verse 12. Look at what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. So think about that. How, think about the impact those words would have had on the disciples. Think about the things they would have witnessed over the last three and a half years that they would have spent with Jesus. They would have seen Jesus calm storms and walk on water. They would have seen Jesus multiply food for a crowd of people with just a simple lunch. They would have seen Jesus heal the sick and even raise the dead. And then Jesus says, and I'm leaving you. And when I leave, I'm gonna send someone. The helper is gonna come. The Holy Spirit is gonna come. And when he comes, you are going to do greater works than even I have done. Now, if you're honest, that sounds a little too good to be true, doesn't it? If we're just really being super honest as we read these verses, well, in the next two chapters, Jesus would go on to explain to them that what he just said in this very powerful, incredible statement, how it would be true. And we don't have time to look at every single one of those verses this morning, but I just wanna give you some highlights and you could go back and read these two chapters. I encourage you to do that between now and next Sunday. But look at what Jesus says about this Holy Spirit who's going to come after he has gone to the Father. Look at what he says the Holy Spirit will do. Verse 16 of chapter 14, he says he will be their helper. Verse 17 of chapter 14, he said he would dwell with them and in them. He said in verse 26 that he would teach them and remind them of the words of Jesus. Verse 27, he says he would give them peace. Chapter 15, in the first 10 verses where we read a very familiar passage of scripture where Jesus says that he is the vine and we are the branches, he says that the Holy Spirit will be the one that helps us abide in Christ. The Holy Spirit will be how we would abide in Christ and bear fruit. He said that the Holy Spirit would be how they would and how we would experience joy and peace in a life that's full of uncertainty. And not only would the Holy Spirit help them experience joy and peace, but he also says in chapter 15 going into chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit would be how they would have the strength to face persecution, difficult times, and to continue to be a faithful witness for Christ for all of their lives. He says, greater things will you do than you even saw me do because the Holy Spirit comes. And then in chapter 16, we see the other side of this, this frame that he is in this discussion about the Holy Spirit. Look at what he says in verse seven of chapter 16. He says, nevertheless, he's just reminded them again, by the way, that he's going to the Father. And he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. You might have a translation that says it is better for you. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Yeah. Let me ask you, do you believe that? I mean, even with everything that Jesus has just said in these two chapters, as they are headed toward the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus will be betrayed and arrested and taken to Caiaphas's house and then before Pilate and then beaten and taken to a cross. In this final time that Jesus is spending with his disciples before the cross, he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. And he explains to them why it's going to be for their advantage do you really believe that? Do we, do we truly believe that it is better? Even with all these great promises about the Holy Spirit, I mean, isn't Jesus beside us? Wouldn't that be incredible? 
But here's the truth I want us to understand. Jesus says there's something even better than his physical presence beside us. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity in us. And church, can I say this to all of us this morning? If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you have put your faith in him alone for your salvation, then the words of Jesus here are absolutely as true for you today as they were for the disciples 2,000 years ago, that you have something even better than they had because you have the Holy Spirit with you and in you. So I want us to spend the time we have left this morning looking at just three ways that we see in the New Testament about how the Holy Spirit works in the life of a believer and collectively then in the life of the church because that's something I want us to keep in mind as we, as we think about the Holy Spirit over the next few weeks. The Holy Spirit has a work that he does personally in each one of us and we see that all through the New Testament. But then there's a bigger thing that the Holy Spirit is doing as he's working in you and you and you and you and me. There's a work he's doing in us collectively as his body, as his church, as he's working in us individually. So keep that in mind as we think about what it is we see in the pages of scripture about what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. One of the first things we see about the Holy Spirit's work, we see it in what Jesus said, and then we see it in the words that we saw in John, but then we see it all through the rest of the New Testament, and that is this, that the Holy Spirit empowers the Holy Spirit, one of his work is that of empowering believers. Let's just take Peter for example. There are so many that we could look at in the book of Acts. If you read through the book of Acts and you read it with the lenses to say, how do I see the Holy Spirit moving? It's going to jump off the pages of scripture at you. But in the life of Peter, think about what Peter has done with Jesus beside him. He stood up and said, Jesus, I would never deny you. And then denies him. Jesus says, I've got to go to the cross. Peter says, no. Jesus has had to say, get behind me, Satan. Right? Peter in the garden of Gethsemane pulls out his sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest servant, just reacting to what he sees before him. We see Peter walking on water to Jesus, but then doubting the power of Jesus and starting to sink into the water. So think of all the moments in Peter's life that he would probably have you forget if he could. That was with Jesus beside him. But now in Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit comes, this promise that Jesus made in John chapter 14 and in John chapter 16, that when he goes away, the Spirit would come. In Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit falls. He falls on those disciples waiting for his spirit to fall and we see a completely different group of men. And we see a completely different Peter. The Peter who was scared to stand up for Jesus when Jesus was just yards away from him. Now Peter stands up in, in Jerusalem there at the time of the Passover when there would have been thousands upon thousands of people gathered. The very people that Peter was scared of just days before, Peter now stands up. And listen, look at what he says in John, in, in Acts chapter two. It says, Peter standing with the other 11 lifted up his voice and he addressed them. And if we read on in chapter two and into chapter three of Acts, we would read this powerful sermon that he preached on the day of Pentecost. And you probably know that as a result of that sermon and the move of the Holy Spirit empowering Peter, over 3,000 people got saved that day. Hallelujah. The Spirit in Peter empowering him was greater than even Jesus beside him. If we were to read on in Acts, we would see Peter and John 
In chapter four, standing before the council made up of Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and all these religious leaders who had been responsible for, for, for sending Jesus to the cross. They were the ones calling for his crucifixion. And now they've got Peter and John before them and they're threatening them with their very lives saying, don't you ever talk about Jesus again. Do you hear me? And Peter stands up and what does it say? He is filled with the Holy Spirit. This is that empowering Holy Spirit. And he says to them, rulers of the people and elders, and he goes on from there to say, we can't help but speak of what we've seen and heard. We're not gonna back down. Now, does that sound like Peter and John? They ran at the first sign of trouble. Peter denied Jesus when he thought his life might be in jeopardy, but now because of the spirit in them, empowering them, there's boldness to proclaim who Jesus is and that he is alive. The work of the Holy Spirit is an empowering work. And it's not just for Peter and John. And it's not just for Stephen in chapter eight of Acts or, or Philip as he meets with the Ethiopian eunuch or Paul and Silas and Barnabas and, and all the people we see in the book of Acts who are moved and led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Church, that's for us as well. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live differently. But there's more to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us than, than empowering. There's more that he does. I mean, that's incredible in and of itself, but if we were to look in the pages of the New Testament to see the other things that happen because of the Holy Spirit indwelling us, I want you to think about what some of those might be for just a minute. In John 14 and verse 26, in looking at the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, he says the Holy Spirit would be our teacher, in chapter 15, verse 26, it says he would illuminate the things of God. He would help us to see Jesus in a more powerful way than we could without him. Think about the disciples when they were with Jesus. How many times did they have to pull Jesus inside and say, I didn't get what you were saying? I mean, whoop, just went right over my head, right? I mean, that was the disciples. They got confused. They were anxious. They doubted. Even as they witnessed and watched and listened to Jesus, the Son of God, God incarnate, God in the flesh, even then they didn't get it. They missed it. They were confused, misunderstood. But now, it says because of the Holy Spirit, he would teach them all of these truths that Jesus was proclaiming. He would help them to, to see. The blinders would come off, the scales would fall off, and they would see clearly. John chapter 16, it says, Jesus would be their, the Holy Spirit would be their guide to lead them. And when I think about those three things, and I was reading in the book of Acts this week, I was reading Peter's sermon and then I was reading other places in Acts where the disciples, when they would have an opportunity to speak of Jesus, you know what they were doing? They were looking back at Old Testament scriptures, Old Testament prophecies from the book of Isaiah and the book of Joel, and they are now seeing how those passages from the Old Testament scriptures point to who Jesus is and the work that he came to do. These guys didn't come up with that by themselves. Who revealed that to them? The Holy Spirit illuminated their minds and their hearts to bring to mind, this is what the Old Testament was pointing to. It's what we just witnessed Jesus do. Church, isn't it an incredible thought to think that the same Holy Spirit that brought to mind the truths of Scripture and helped them to see Jesus in them is waiting for us to dig into the pages of God's word to see him in powerful ways, in ways that help us understand him better and live for him. 
Not only did he teach and illuminate and guide them, Paul talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter eight. The whole chapter is about the work of the Holy Spirit. The one thing we see in verses 26 and 27 is that the Holy Spirit is our intercessor in prayer. It says we don't even know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit interprets even our groanings and takes them before the Father. The Holy Spirit is working even as we pray and cry out to God. But the whole chapter really refers to it because the whole chapter of Romans 8 is talking about the work of sanctification. What is the work of sanctification? That is, that is part of what the gospel is all about. Not only are we justified and declared righteous before God because of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us, but then we are in a process from now till God calls us home. We are in a process of sanctification where we are being conformed more and more into the image of Jesus so that we live out in, in today who we are positionally right now in heaven. The work of sanctification is just conforming us to look more like that every day so that we can glorify Jesus and be a light for him in this world. Who does that for us? Romans 8, Paul says, it's the work of the Spirit that sanctifies us. 22 times in Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about the Spirit. He only talks about the Spirit 10 times in the rest of the book of Romans. Do you think there's something he wants us to know about what the Holy Spirit does when he indwells us? It's a work of sanctification. He goes on in Galatians, in Galatians chapter five, in verse 22, we read about the fruit of the, come on, you were, you were asleep. The fruit of the, there we go, all right. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He says all of those are the work of sanctification in our lives, and they are only possible through the work of the Holy Spirit. And just so that he gets our attention, in Galatians chapter five, Paul shows before that, he goes, look, here's what you looked like before the Holy Spirit indwelled you. And he talks about all the characteristics of our flesh and all of these just awful things that we engage in and that are part of who our heart. He says, but look, when the Holy Spirit transforms you, it's to your advantage that I go away because the Holy Spirit will do this work in you to conform you into the image of Jesus, to show him to others. Over the next couple of weeks, we are gonna look at another one of the results of the indwelling Holy Spirit, and that is his work of giving gifts. I would say many of you have taken a spiritual gifts test at one point or time in your Christian walk. Am I right? That's a work of the Holy Spirit and his indwelling us. It is that he gifts each of us supernaturally, with gifts to strengthen the body, to build up the body, the local church, so that we can live our lives on mission. And we're gonna dig into that. We're gonna dig into that here in a couple of weeks, and we're gonna dig into that in our growth groups next week to look at his work of giving gifts. We're gonna discover what those are, maybe in a, in a greater way with more clarity than we have before so that we know how to live our lives on mission. How do we even do that, though? It's through the work of the Spirit. So he empowers, he indwells. There's a very individual aspect of that, but then we're seeing there's a collective work he's doing through those things within the body and, and in, our, in the world and our community. There's another work of the Spirit that we see in the New Testament, and it is that of unifying. After the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and, and all these people were saved after Peter's sermon, the Holy Spirit moved and people surrendered their lives to Christ, we see on the heels of that sermon just in, some insight into what this group of people are now doing. 
And in Acts chapter two, starting in verse 44, you can turn there if you want to. I'll read it for you if you don't have time to get there. It says, and all who believed were together, had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and their belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number. Occasionally, day by day, those who were being saved. Another example of how the Holy Spirit in us is even better than the Jesus beside us. Think about the disciples when they had Jesus with them, when they were walking with him. They were not always a very unified group of guys, were they? In fact, even after spending years with him, they were still arguing about who would be the greatest. James and John, the two brothers, had their mama go to Jesus you know how mamas, you know, you're looking out for your boys. You know, they, mama went to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, can you give them special treatment? Who do you think put her up to that? You know, I mean, these guys, there wasn't unity. It was looking out for themselves. How do I get my spot? How, how do I get a notch above these other guys? But now with the Holy Spirit indwelling them, what do we see This group of people who now, because of the work of the Holy Spirit, they were not just a group of people now, they were a church. They were a body. We see unity. We see them them serving one another. We see them fellowshipping together. We see them worshiping, and we see them being used by God as a unified body to continue to spread the gospel and, and win more people to Christ. That's a unifying work of the Spirit. Church, we need that here today, amen? Our churches all over this nation and all over this world need to be reminded that one of the works of the Holy Spirit is to bring unity to the saints. In and of ourselves, that is not possible. We like to hold grudges. We like to not show forgiveness, right? We, 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 we want to seek our best interest, but can I tell you this? The work of the Holy Spirit does a supernatural thing in us that says, I don't have to look out for my best interest. I can trust God with what I need, and I can then turn my attention to serving you and honoring you and building you up and caring for you. You know how winsome that is to a world that they don't see that anywhere, but they need to desperately see it in the church. That's why God continued to add to their numbers in the book of Acts. They saw something that they didn't have, this unity. Paul goes on to talk about that unity in Ephesians chapter two. We don't have time to turn there, but but there's several things he says about the work of the Spirit beginning in verse 18. He says that we, as believers in Jesus, because of the Holy Spirit's work, we are fellow citizens with the saints. He says we are members of God's household. He says we're joined together. He says we're built together into a dwelling place for God. All of those things. He says, are by the Spirit. So church, even this morning, does that not just make you want to begin leaning in and thinking about what it is the Holy Spirit can do in and through our lives? To begin to say, do I see him empowering me? Am I trusting him to do that? Am I seeing the the fruit of his indwelling me? Is the Holy Spirit, is he, is, am I allowing the Holy Spirit to use me to bring unity to the body of Christ so that God can use us together? So as we prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for the next few weeks and what it is I believe God's gonna say to us, I wanna give you three things to be reminded of about what it is, some truths about the Holy Spirit that we need to keep in mind with everything we read 
about the Holy Spirit, these are three truths about him that we need to keep in mind. Just some observations that, that we see as we read the New Testament. Number one, the Holy Spirit, see him. Every time you read about the Spirit, see him as a spotlight. I think it's fascinating that we never see the Holy Spirit drawing attention to himself. He's always pointing to Jesus. He's always pointing and exalting and glorifying the Son of God. Let me say it this way. If we don't cherish the gospel, if we don't cherish the message of who Jesus is and what it is he has done, then we're not going to see a move of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's mission and purpose is to exalt Jesus. Do we wanna see the Holy Spirit move in us and through us in a powerful way? Then we need to cherish the work of Jesus and, and know the gospel and preach the gospel to ourselves. Where the gospel is cherished, that is where we see the Holy Spirit experienced. Say it a different way. If you are not making much of Jesus with your life, then you're not walking in the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a spotlight to Jesus. Something else about the Holy Spirit that you're gonna see in everything we read about him and, and see about him in the pages of scripture over the next few weeks, the Holy Spirit gives life. Romans chapter eight, verse 11, Paul says it this way. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your model, mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Church, the work of the spirit is to give life, not just eternal life, but life today, to experience life a freshness, a joy, a purpose that cannot be had apart from him. And it is something special. I mean, think about that. It's resurrection life. Did you see, did you hear what Paul said? The spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will give life, the same spirit will give life to you. Are we walking in resurrection life? Do we go through life more focused on how we're going to do things? Or, or do we work on trying to figure things out for ourselves? Or are we relying on the Holy Spirit to guide us and to teach us and to empower us and to strengthen us? Why would we settle for what we can do in our own strength when the Holy Spirit's work is to give life and empower us to live for him? One other thing that's gonna be so important for us to remember about the Holy Spirit as we move forward is that God's word and the Holy Spirit operate in one powerful way. The Holy Spirit inspired the word of God to be written and the Holy Spirit teaches us the word of God. The Holy Spirit makes the word of God personal. If you want to experience the Holy Spirit in a greater way, let me challenge you in this way. Immerse yourself in scripture. If you wanna see the Holy Spirit work in you, he will work in you as this book becomes more precious to you. This is how he speaks. And I think if, I'm, if we're honest, one of the reasons there's a hesitancy to lean in and think about the work of the Holy Spirit is because we've seen abuses when people talk about the Holy Spirit. It's been much more about a feeling and, and some kind of an emotional high or experience. And we've seen the Holy Spirit talk about him taken to an extreme that is unhealthy and unbiblical. And so our reaction many times has been, well, we're just gonna go way over here. Both are wrong. The Holy Spirit wants to meet us right here in the word of God and do the things in our lives that he says he will do. We shouldn't be afraid of it. We should seek to understand it. 
and to know him through the pages of his word. Seeking the spirit in the word of God. So this morning, even today as we begin our study in this journey together, what is it that, that God would have us do? Right, because if we come to the pages of scripture and we just get more content and we don't stop and think about how we apply it to our lives, we're missing so much. So how do we apply this, even what we've seen today, the truth we've seen today, how do we apply that to our lives? I can tell you this week, I have, I have been wrestling, asking God to speak to me, to show me how to apply these truths about the Spirit to my life and, and what knowing this should produce in my behavior. And I'm just gonna share those with you. And I'm praying, even in these moments, that, that God, through his spirit that indwells you, would begin to bring to mind how he wants to use the word of God in your life to illuminate Jesus, to sanctify you, to conform you, to encourage you. So here's the things. First of all, the reality of the work of the Holy Spirit should produce in me a freedom. A freedom to unite with a body of believers. Totally surrendered to the Holy Spirit that indwells me, allows me to live a life that glorifies God. If I can be surrendered, if I can be free to know that the Holy Spirit is the one working, the Holy Spirit is the one acting, the Holy Spirit is the one that empowers, he does the work as I yield and surrender to his work, there's a freedom then to just allow my life to be used by God. I don't have to be hung up on this or that. I can trust him. With it. There's a freedom there when I know it's the Holy Spirit working. There's also a confidence, knowing that the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches and guides and intercedes and even gifts us to walk with Jesus. It gives us a confidence to walk with him by faith, no matter what it might cost, no matter the step of obedience that we might have to take, right? No matter how countercultural it might be, the Holy Spirit gives us a confidence to just walk with Jesus day by day. There's a confidence that comes from him. Knowing it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the word of God, that illuminates the word of God, and that meets us in the word of God, Shouldn't the Holy Spirit in us produce a dependence upon the word of God? Amen. Shouldn't it cause us to just go to the pages of the word of God every day, not so we can check a box to say, I've been spiritual today, but I need to go to the pages of the word of God because that's where I'm gonna meet the spirit of God and that's where the spirit of God is going to equip me and, get, and strengthen me and encourage me and empower me to do what God has called me to do. And if I'm not in this word, I'm missing that. I need it. Church, my prayer for us is that as we look at the Holy Spirit, it would create such an appetite for the word of God in each and every one of us and a dependence upon it. I wrote this note down in my Bible for myself. Experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives is directly related to our submission to the authority of the word of God in our lives. The level that we will experience the power of the Spirit will depend upon how submitted we are to the authority of the word of God in our lives. They move together. 
And finally, the empowering work of the Holy Spirit should produce in us an anticipation. Not just an anticipation for the day that God calls us home, because Paul does say that the Holy Spirit is that seal, that guarantee that we belong to God and we will spend eternity with him. That is a work of the Spirit, is to just cause us to long for heaven and to long to be with him. But church, there is another joyful anticipation that should be ours. The indwelling Holy Spirit ought to cause us every day, every morning we wake up, and there's breath in our lungs to be mindful that there's a work that God wants to do now through us. Otherwise, why would he indwell us? The work of the Holy Spirit is not about the future in eternity. The work of the Holy Spirit is about the here and now so that we as a body of believers would be mobilized, we would be empowered, we would be indwelt, we would be unified, not so we could sit around and say, isn't it exciting that we're empowered and indwelt and unified? No, it's so that we would get off these seats and get out and use the gifts he's given us to impact the lost world with the gospel. That's why we have the Holy Spirit, is to do that work. So church, how much do we wanna see God use us? Do we really believe what Jesus said, that greater works will we do because of the Holy Spirit? Incarnate Christ was in one place at a time when he walked on earth. In this room, the Holy Spirit goes with you everywhere you go. We get to multiply the power and presence of God in this world as we walk with the Spirit. Do you wanna be used by him? Do you wanna experience a vibrant walk with him and not just know about him, but know him? Church, let's get excited about the work of the Spirit and what it is he wants to do in and through our hearts. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray, and our our praise team is, is gonna come. And here's here's the here's the prayer this morning. God created me an appetite that can only be satisfied through your Holy Spirit empowering me and dwelling me because of the finished work of Jesus. Father, I thank you this morning for this time we have. God, would you, would you use it? God, would you do what only you can do in our hearts? Would you teach us? Convict us, challenge us for your glory in Jesus' name, amen.